start a new book for a sermon series. We're in First John, so this is chapter one on all the verses one through ten. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. This life was made manifest, and we've seen it. We testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that our joy may be completed. This is the message we heard from Him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not do the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have never sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. May God and His blessing to the reading of His word. I pointed out lots of times in either sermons or Bible studies the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is that roller coaster ride, and you get that quick thrill and a uh, happy feeling, and yet it fades just as quickly as it comes. Joy is deeper than that, and it lasts even in hard times, so that we can literally be crying and still be joyful because it's something so much deeper within our souls. Jesus is the only one who can give us that true spiritual joy. It never fades away, no matter what kind of suffering that we have to go through. It's his joy that he's sharing with us. And it's not ever going to be content until it's shared with others around us as well. When others receive the same joy we receive, that's when our joy becomes complete. That's what our text uh, lifts up for us as, uh, as John starts his letter off. Again, a general letter, not to just one particular church. He begins in a very personal sharing. And it's so tangible, the things he says here. You know, we've heard with our ears. We've seen with our eyes. We beheld him. Our hands touched him. This Jesus. He was just a man in one sense. And yet, he was from the beginning. The word of life. The eternal word who was with the Father and shown to us. So we saw him and touched him, and yet he's this eternal word who's always lived and always been there. Go back to his gospel and John, of John in the first uh, chapter, verse 3, he says everything was made through him. Not anything was made, it was made apart from him. So he's the center and the purpose of all existence in creation. He gives meaning to everything. And John is saying, we saw him and heard his words and we touched him with our hands. This one who is really the center of all of the existence. And now by this letter he says, we announce or declare him to you also. So that you too may have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his son Jesus. That's where, why we're writing this, John says, that our joy may be completed. If Jesus' joy that has come to us is shared with others, then John's joy becomes complete. The joy that carries us through every trial and every uh, evil act that would come upon us in any kind of way. How does that joy do that? Well, let's see what John declares here. He says, first of all, God is light. And darkness is not in them at all. In our hard times, in other words, it's wrong to say God is punishing me or God is condemning me. That would make God just as dark as we are. 
And he says, no, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So it's wrong to think of God that way. The light that he speaks of here in his gospel and in the rest of the letter, he also equates with love and life, which is, a, a, is so different from punishment or condemnation. Now, if we really know this God who is light, that means we will no longer be content for darkness to be in our own lives as well. It won't be good enough just to say that, okay, we're with God and still be content to do things like we used to do them. That would be, John says, lying and not doing the truth. Now, that's an odd phrase. Uh, I think our translations of practicing the truth, uh, which is okay. Um, but typically, we think of hearing the truth or receiving the truth, knowing the truth. But uh, truth here isn't just a concept. It's a way of life that comes, and it was a specific life. Jesus, we had back in our call to worship, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So truth is something that's not just a concept in our head, but something that has to be lived out or acted upon. And so if we do not do that, you know, then it says uh, we're lying and not doing the truth. But if, on the other hand, we walk as Jesus walked, we have true fellowship with God and one another. We ask Jesus to work through our life and then he cleanses us from the sin of what we were going to do in the first place. Now, he says, John quickly adds, that doesn't mean that we can say we no longer have any sin at all in any kind of way. That would be deceiving ourselves. He said, and the truth is not in us. But he says, instead, we confess our sin. To me, that's saying again, like, Lord, if it's up to me, I'm going to be unforgiving, or I'm going to be hurtful, I'm going to be greedy, or whatever it is that I'm tempted to do at the moment. So please come and do through me what I can't do for myself, and by myself. That's real confession. Confession is agreeing with Christ and saying things together with Christ. Confession isn't just, oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. It's something you do after, after you sin. Confessing is something you do before we act out sins so that we won't act them out if Jesus will work through us. And the way John says that is, if we confess, he says he's faithful and righteous. So in a spiritual way, unseen to our eyes, he forgives the sins and cleanses us from every unjustness. So in other words, that action that was going to be unforgiving if it was left up to me or greedy or, or hurtful, God, uh, Jesus in a hidden way comes and works through us and he actually makes our action helpful instead of harmful. So that's what it means about uh, cleansing from sin. He cleanses what would have just been another sin of ours and he makes it into a good action that actually helps other people. So he seems to be saying that call, call on Jesus always and he will guide us through every trial with the love and joy that God has for us. Now if we would want to say, well, why should I call upon Jesus? And John adds at the end here, that would be the same as saying I had not sinned. Either saying I've never sinned or I haven't sinned in so long, so why do I need to call upon Jesus? I can do fine acting on my own. And he said, well, that would be the same as saying that God is a liar. And so, which of course isn't true, and so his word is not in us. We can't pretend to know the true God unless we acknowledge that we're not sinless in the way that Jesus was. So Jesus is the only sinless person that lived on this earth but he was sinless for our sake so that in eternity we get to be sinless. And in the here and now, we don't become content of just acting in sin in the way everybody else acts, but we pray and ask him ahead of time 
to change our actions by him working through them so that something better occurs. In practical terms, it just means we need Jesus all the time in order to live not just in us but through us so we can do the truth. And so instead of hurting others, they're actually helped by others and they receive that joy that doesn't fade away. And when they receive that joy, then our joy becomes completed because it was shared with others. Let's hear how a young woman named Vicki Aldous uh, experienced someone else who she never names in the story uh, sharing God's joy with her. It happened at a time, she said, when I never felt farther from God in my whole life. It was a Sunday morning, she was far from home, and she was feeling uh, all alone. A few months before, in her junior year in high school, Vicki had talked to an army recruiter about the reserves. Uh, back then, the reserves weren't put into action so much uh, overseas, especially as they are now, so this was written a little earlier. So he was basically saying, you can earn money for college, you just have two months of basic training in the summer between your junior and senior year. Then you have some more training in the summer after graduation. And after that, it's just some occasional weekends and it's always in your home state. We maybe remember you used to see reserves like going to a flood area or something like that and they would help out do sandbagging and, and things like that. So Vicki thought that this seemed perfect. How hard could two months be? Well, after a week or two, she found out of having to get up at 4 a.m. and start the day with physical exercise. It was either an hour of sit-ups and push-ups, or it was running from three to five miles. So she said, after a week, I was so, uh, I was so sore, I could barely move. She said she could feel it hurting when she'd lift her fork up to her mouth while she was eating, because everything in her body was sore. So she was doing sit-ups there one morning and it hadn't, uh, the sun hadn't even dawned yet. And she looked into the sky and she wondered if there really was a God up there. Had he forsaken me? There was this constant yelling by the drill sergeants at every action, no matter how trivial it was. There was no privacy. They only got about five hours uh, sleep, which we know teenagers don't think that's an uh, adequate amount of sleep, usually, especially on weekends. They were not allowed to cry. That was seen as a sign of weakness, so you can't do that in any kind of way. We were constantly on edge and irritated with one another. If somebody made a mistake, everybody in the platoon paid for it. She said, I know the logic of this. They wanted peer pressure to get us to start acting as a unit. So even when the sergeant's back was turned, we started policing each other, you know, and trying to correct each other. Everybody was pitted against everybody else. And so on this Sunday morning, they saw the roster for duty, so that they had to scrub the barracks clean, and then they had to mow and rake a, uh, a lawn that was the size of a football field. And immediately when people are lined up, they started fighting with each other over who was going to get the morning shifts while it was still cool. Uh, and the others having to do the afternoon when it was warmer. And Vicki was, she just was so tired she didn't want to deal with it. So she signed up for an afternoon shift and decided for a change of pace that she would go to church that morning. Which all she was looking for was peace and quiet. Well, there was a large group of troops in the chapel, and she sat with 10 other girls from her platoon. Said it was the fourth service of the day, and so the chaplain looked very tired uh, giving the sermon, as if he was probably tired of hearing it too by that time. And so she didn't get a lot out of the sermon. Instead, she's just sitting there feeling so alone. Why couldn't God show me that he still loved me? Well, after the sermon, the uh, chaplain had asked if anyone was wanting to share anything that day. And most everybody's head just went down immediately, but one girl stood up and she nervously said, I'd like to sing a song that I wrote. Vicki couldn't believe anybody would be brave enough to do that, but there she came up front 
and she started to sing this song. God, I'm feeling so alone in this place so far from home. Please listen to this prayer and show me you still care. Vicki couldn't believe it when she heard this first verse. Someone else felt like I did. Every verse echoed my own secret thoughts. She said she felt overwhelmed with self-pity and she was starting to have tears well up in her eyes that she's trying to fight back because that's the way we were trained to do and she didn't want anyone to see but she looked around at the uh, uh, ten companions around her and everyone was fighting back tears. And then uh, she said it dawned on her. God hadn't abandoned us. He gave us each other. The girls looked around and realized it was okay to cry and then after crying they were smiling during the song and they were hugging each other by the time they got to this last verse that said, How could I have been so blind? Why did it take so long to find? Your love is before my eyes in the friends you supply. God had shown us, Vicky said, that he was still there and that he loved us. She had wanted the hardness of basic training just to be taken away from her, like suddenly it disappeared and it would all be easy. But instead, she found others to share her journey with her. A journey where they could all share in the joy of our Lord Jesus, as the unnamed singer shared the joy with her. People pursue happiness every day. And yet it's very, very fleeting. What's more helpful is for joy. It remains there in the hard times. Jesus alone shares that joy with us. So by turning to him, may we share that joy with others. And then we'll find that our joy has been completed.